Hello. <clears throat> In this presentation, we're going to discuss algorithms and basic flow control. Before writing a program to solve a problem, you need to have a thorough understanding of the problem and a carefully planned approach to solving it. Understanding the available building blocks and employing them in proven program construction techniques. An algorithm is any solvable computing problem that can be solved by the execution of a series of actions in a specific order. It also must terminate. That's the other part of the definition of an algorithm. An algorithm is a procedure for starting for solving a problem in terms of actions and ordering of execution. Specifying the order is done through uh, various different types of mechanisms that are called program control. We are going to discuss C++'s control scheme. So you'll see in this some of these examples, we'll use pseudocode, an informal language to help develop al algorithms. It's very close to English, and it's informal. There's no specific requirements. Um, it helps you think through a problem. And it can usually be converted pretty straightforwardly to C++. The example below is pseudocode for uh, adding two integers. Prompt the user to enter an integer, input the first, Prompt the user to enter the second, input the second, add the first and second, store the result, display result. Sometimes, if you're like me, your pseudocode looks like half programming and half English. Um, so control structures, normally program statements are executed in order. This is called sequential execution. C++ has statements to alter what is executed next, and this is called transfer of control. All programs can be written using three control, control structures. This is sequence structure selection structure, and iteration structure. And any language that supports all these three can be said to be Turing complete. Uh, and that's just an aside. Um, so, unless directed, <coughs> C++ statements execute in the order in which they're written. The UML, Unified Modeling Language, activity diagram, it'll illustrate a sequence structure in which two calculations are performed. C++ allows multiple actions in a sequence structure. Anywhere a single action can be placed, several actions can also be used. So, here's the sequence structure. We start at the beginning. Here's sequence 1. Uh, add graded total and the corresponding C++. Add 1 to counter and the corresponding C++. And then execute code. This is just for information. Um, you use sequence structures once in a while, but not as much as you might think. An activity diagram models the workflow or activity of a portion of a system. Workflows, oops, workflows may include a portion of an algorithm, such as the sequence structure shown above. Activity diagrams are composed of symbols such as action states, which are the ovals, diamonds, and small circles. These are connected by transition arrows. Um, activity diagrams can be used to develop and represent algorithms, but pseudocode is a lot more uh, common or flow charts. Activity states uh, represent actions that perform. So the solid circle at the beginning is the initial state, the double circle at the bottom is the end state. Um, we're not going to go into too much more detail. Oops, now we want to select C++ plus, plus has three types of selection statements, actually kind of only really two. But an if statement either performs one or more actions if a condition is true or skips it if the action is if the condition is false. And if else statement performs actions if a condition or predicate is true or performs different actions if the condition is false. A switch statement is like a super else if uh, performs one of many different actions depending on the value of an expression. So an if statement is a single selection statement because it selects or ignores a single action set. An if else is a double selection statement. A switch is a multiple selection statement. C++ provides three types of iteration statements, loops, for performing statements repeatedly. So the loop con continuation condition, while a condition is true, do this. So that keeps you in the loop. While your number of times you've asked to use it for input is less than 10, do this. There's also a do while statement, which says, do this while. And the difference is, while doesn't always do anything, because something's not true at the beginning. And do while always goes through your code at least once. And for is essentially a shorthand. Um, 
Now, one thing to keep in mind, you can't use keywords as identifiers, variables, etc. Just a reminder. So, programs are formed by combining as many control statements as needed for the algorithm we implement. We can model each control statement as an activity diagram. Um, and there are other ways to modify them within control statements. So, an if statement. Programs use selection statements to choose among alternatives. Pseudocode to determine whether a student's grade is greater than or equal to 60. If student passed, grade is greater than or equal to 60, print passed. If it's true, it's print passed and the next statement is performed. Um, if it's false, the statement's ignored altogether. We use indentation to emphasize the structure of the program. So let's take the above example. And implement. So let's come over here, and we're also going to include lib to get us a randomized function. And so here we're going to get a random grade. Int grade equals rand. Mod 100 plus 1. We want to start from 1. Okay, and then we're going to SRAN and to make sure our RAN produces different values, we're going to set our RAN to time of 0. Time. And then what we will do is if grade is greater than 60, now if the student fails, it's not going to print anything. So let's run this a few times. First, let's also output the grade. run it. See what we get. Grade 20, we didn't pass. Grade 67, we passed. Grade 38, we didn't pass. Grade 69, we passed. So, in C++, a decision can be based on any expression that evaluates to zero or non-zero. If the expression evaluates to zero, it's treated as false. If it evaluates to non-zero, it's treated as true. C++ also has the bool data type for Boolean values that can only hold true or false. The assignment or decision symbol indicates that a decision is be, to be made. The workflow will continue along the path of the symbol's guard condition, which can be either true or false. There are two paths. If else performs an action when the condition is true and a different is false. So we can modify our example to print uh, pass or fail. And here's the diagram for it as well. So let's go back to the code. And we can add an else statement here. Else. Oops, not actually graphic. And then we're gonna, uh, we're gonna put a statement that gets executed afterwards, regardless of what the if says. If we run it once, we're going to get a pass, another pass, a failure, etc. Notice it takes both options. Okay, we can also nest our if statements um, for multiple cases by nesting if else statement inside each other. So here's, we could use this to implement our, our grades. So let's take a look. Oops, sorry. Alrighty. So now we're going to 
We're going to counter this out. Here and we're going to do nested ifs. So what we can say here is if grade is greater than ninety. Say else if grade is greater than eighty, then notice that this could also be written like this. And while this will work the same, uh, I think the other form is clear. Else, we could say here, if grade is greater than 70, etc. But I think that is a very cumbersome way to do it. So instead, we'll simplify our code a little bit. Else if and we'll say here you got me. And then we will repeat it for C's and D's. Final else will be if, in the case of, you got a D or you fail. All right, so now if we run it, we should get a better grade report this time. Failure. C. Whoops, notice a bug. I forgot to change this to 60. Notice, though, that it would never get to that because we've already checked the 80 rule. 7, we failed again. Got an A, nice. Uh, failed. Got a B, etc. Just like we think. Wow, a lot of F's. I hope this class didn't turn out that way. Oh, two 100s. That's pretty good. All right. So now, um, as I said before, those two forms are identical, um, but this form makes it cleaner and easier to understand. So there's something called the dangling else problem. As a rule, we always control enclose control statement bodies and braces. With single line of, lines of code, you technically don't have to do what you should because this avoids a logic error called the dangling else problem, which can cause an else to match with the wrong if. So don't even think that that option exists. Just basically put your squirrely brackets in. So an if statement only requires one statement. To include several statements in an if or else statement, we enclose a statement in braces. The good practice is always to use braces. Statements in a pair of braces form a block, and a block can be placed anywhere a single statement can be placed. It's also happy, possible to have an empty statement uh, by just putting a semicolon there. And a semicolon after a colon brace will give you a syntax error, though. That is not, not legal. You can't have closing brace and then semicolon. Except in the case of defining classes and structures, which we'll come to. Now, we vaguely touched on it earlier. 
The conditional operator is closely related to the if-else statement. The operands plus the conditional operator perform a conditional expression. The first operand is a condition. The second operand is the expression if condition is true. The third is if it's false. The values can also be actions such as function calls. So we can modify um, whoops, we can modify the I'm um, sorry that was an example that shouldn't be there yet, but we can modify our example to use the um, nested, um, I mean the condition operator, and here's an example, right, let's say, okay, string, grade, let, a grade, equals, here's our conditional, grade is greater than 90, say if it's true we'll return you pass otherwise we'll return you failed you didn't get an A okay now we can do that for B's, C's, D's, and F's we're going to say grade 80. Let's change the string to say we've got an A. B. B. We've got a C. And so forth. I think you get the idea. Basically, although we show you the last one, uh, string degrade, or the last two, degrade, string 60, you got a D. Now, I'm deliberately leading a bug in here. I wonder if any of you will catch it. Now, here's the problem with using this approach, is the execution doesn't avoid the other one. So the first time you go through and say you get a 95, it will say A grade equals you got an A. Then it hits B grade. Is B grade greater than 80? You got a B. So in this case, to see if it was really a B, we have to say if grade is greater than 80 and grade is less than 90. Actually, should be greater than or equal to 80. And greater than or equal to 90, etc. So, but that's what the question mark operator is. It's a shorthand notation. So now we're going to move on to while statements. While are the basic looping statements. Uh, they're called iteration statements. It specifies that a program should repeat an action while some condition is true. There are more items on my list is true or false, for example. While there are more items on my list, purchase the next item. If true, purchase the next item and cross off my list. If, if false, um, it'll just exit the loop. Eventually, the condition will become false and the iteration will terminate. The statement following loop will execute. Now, Consider code that finds the first power of 3 larger than 100. When running the following code, 
uh, it contains the result. Now, let's take a look. Okay, right. Second. Basic while. Equals three. While. Power. That is less than one hundred. So that means we'll also print it out here. Right. And then we'll move across past 100. Pack 400, we will print the final value. So hit the CL. Okay, all right, so now let's run this guy and see what we get. Oops, I didn't come out come out some early section of code here. Let's get rid of this. Alright, so 927.243. The final value is 243. And that's the first one after 100. Okay. That's the first, and that's what we expected. However, if the condition never becomes false, we cause an infinite loop. If we get, forgot this statement, no further work is done. Okay. Um, so there's two types of loops. Uh, one type you often run in is a counter control loop. Consider the following problem. A class of 10 students took a quiz. The grades ranging from 0 to 100 are available. Determine the class average. Class average is the sum of the grades divided by the number of students. This algorithm must input each grade, track the total of all grades entered, perform the averaging calculation, and print the result. So we set the total to zero, set grade counter to one, while grade counter is less than 10, prompt the user to enter the next grade and input it, add the grade to the total, add one to the grade counter, and finally, when the loop is done, set the grade average to total divided by 10, and then print the class average. So we're going to implement this algorithm Total is an accumulator used to store sum of several variables. A counter variable is used to count. Grade counter indicates the number of grades about to be entered. Variables used to store program totals are usually set to zero before use. Otherwise, the sum will be wrong. So let's take an example. This guy, put a very simple loop. Okay, so first, let's define our variables. We've got counter, set that to zero. We got sum, set that to zero, and we got user input. Which, well, just to be safe, set to zero. And so we'll say while counter is less than or equal to less than ten because we're starting at zero. Say, um, see out, enter a grade, then we'll say C in, user input, and then what we'll say is sum equals sum plus user input, and then we will print out that sum. Sum okay. 
And then, um, now, if we stop here, we're going to get an infinite loop. Let me just show you real quick what happens. And enter a grade. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. It never is going to stop. Okay. So what we're going to do, we, what we have to do to make that change is we have to increment our counter before the end of the loop. Now, if we run it again, enter grade 75, 76, 25, 110, or I'm sorry, 90, 4, uh, 85, 78, 49, 92, 94, 99, 28, 23, and so our sum is 651. To finish the program, like we said, we take the sum afterwards, say, uh, and we count it, print out its average. Now, some of the things we can do to improve this program is first, let's establish our max count. The number of times we want to uh, maximum count. Okay, so that way, instead of referring to 10, we can say max count, and we don't have to worry about it. Like this. So, when we want to change the value to Encompass fewer or more grades. Let's say we want to only do five grades because I don't want to type all that. Let's run it. And we'll say 76, 78, I'm sorry, 9, 3, oops, that's going to screw up our results, but 88, 2, and the sum is 767 with an average of 153. So obviously somebody blew the curve. Let's try that again. 78, 90, 87, I can't talk today, uh, 76, 4, 32, so the class average is a C. So we can use unsigned integers because it will never go negative, um, but there's a lot of opportunity for bugs in counter loops. For example, um, a variable in a function body is a local variable and is only used from the declaration on a direction. A local variable's declaration must appear before use. Um, dividing two integer, uh, we're going to set the math a little bit here. Um, we can run into the situation of an arithmetic overflow. Um, if we exceed um, a value that's too large, we get an error called uh, arithmetic overflow, and it calls undefined behavior, which can lead to undefined results. Uh, we can find the maximum and minimum by using looking in C limits. And there's other constants like this, and it's a good practice to ensure before you perform calculations they will not overflow. That's why I brought it. Now, one of the things we can do is, imp is validate our input. For a program inputting grades, we could evaluate the grades by, by checking to ensure that between 0 and 100. You can ask the user to re-enter any values. Um, so let's take a look at how to do that, right? Oops, sorry. All right, so say we want to modify this. And in this case, we'll say uh, if the user input is greater than zero and less than or equal to okay, zero here, greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to 100, 
we want to do this. Otherwise, what we want to do is have the user re-enter. Well, we're just going to prompt them by saying value please re-enter alright now notice here that we don't do the input again here because the next time it wraps around the loop we'll get it so if we run it now and we oops and I have a typo here uh, I forgot to put in my second my variable again repeat it each time for each clause. Okay, so for it again. And we'll run our grade. 92 works fine. Now 110, 102, it's invalid, so it doesn't add it to the sum. So if we finish our sum, it doesn't include that high number. Notice that the counter is only incremented when we have a correct value. So, Averaging calculations often produces a decimal number. Int cannot represent such a number. C++ provides types for storing floating point numbers, including float and double. Double variables can store values with larger numbers and finer detail than float, so you should almost always use uh, double. A cast operator is used to force the calculation to produce a floating point result. So, let's take our example again. And... Um, we're going to add in what's called a sentinel. A sentinel, which isn't represented in this slide, unfortunately, I skipped it, is what if we want to process an arbitrary number of grades? Well, um, we need to enter some sort of dummy value that says this is when we stop. And we don't know the number of iterations, but we need a way to stop so we can enter a negative value. And there are many ways to do that. And let's take an example. Um, go to our same example here. Now, our input's going to cause us a little problem here because it, um, it will get us screwed up. Um, because it'll drop us out of the loop. But anyway, let's modify this a little bit. Let's say um, we're going to do this until user input equals negative 1. Now it will keep going until the value equals negative 1. And now we don't want to use max count. We want to use the actual counter value. So, oops. So let's run this now. We run through the first time. Oh, um, I'm sorry. This should be doesn't doesn't equal. Now here's the problem that this caused, right? <laughs> it because user input um, never equaled negative one because it starts at zero. We drop through to grade. Sum divided by counter will counter zero, and that's going to cause us a uh, divide by zero exception, which is a bad thing, so the program stops. Let's fix that and run. Enter a grade 10, enter a grade 20, enter a 1, and our average is 15. If we run it again, we can now enter 40, 60, 70, negative 1 to get out, and boom, there we go. Now, this will even work when we enter numbers above 100, even though we get the error message, because we still keep the input value. And we have a, an error there, because when we input an invalid value, the count never gets incremented, so it's still going to be zero. So to be 100% safe, we're going to do this. Basically, get, get rid of the possibility that we could have a zero. Because if we can't have a zero in that case, we won't print it. 
So now when we run it, enter 10, and then 1, and it enters. Now there's some sloppiness there because we don't break the, uh, the negative 1 re-enter thing. But I think you get the general concept is we've got a sentinel value that stops us from going forever, but it has to be entered. So, sometimes we need to change the type of a variable. So, we could use a, what's called a cast operator. All right. So, and, th and this is what we use to convert types explicitly and implicitly. Average, let's say average is a double this time, so we can get actual floating point result, results. Um, when we divide it, we lose some precision. So in the statement, so in the statement we use, we say, you know, total divided by number of items. Well, the reality is that might not be an integer. Um, to perform floating point calculations with integers, create a temporary floating point value. So we could make an expression conversion where we say static cast to double of total. And um, it's available for almost every data type. So let's take an example again. All right. We can say here that we want our sum, instead of sum divided by counter being assigned to a integer, we want to say, sorry about that, it's a double in, static cast to double, and we'll convert counter. Now when we run it, we should get the results I was initially expecting. And we get a decimal value. Okay, so back to this. We can talk about how to format floating point numbers. 